Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. It turns out that Mars is far more suitable for colonization than we ever thought. We knew that Mars had lots of water in its ancient past, and we also know that water ice exists in many locations on the planet, but we never thought we'd find it here. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Wasn't really planning to do three full-length videos in a row the way I've been doing this lately, but the headlines have become fast and furious lately, and I've really thought that it was appropriate to cover everything that I've been covering lately. And by the way, if you haven't seen my episode about the Japanese Slim Probe and its miraculous recovery on the moon, or about the European Space Agency's new Moon City concept, well, you might want to check those out. Those are linked at the end of this video. But what's more exciting, I think, than either of those topics, as as exciting as they are, is a recent discovery that was made on Mars. This discovery was actually made a number of days ago, or announced a number of days ago anyway, and I've been planning to do something about it for a while, and finally getting the opportunity. Now, this is nothing new as far as breaking news is concerned. Water on Mars is something we've known about for a considerable amount of time. However, one of the big problems with the water reservoirs that we think that we found on Mars, the sizable deposits of water ice that we think are just beneath the surface, well, the vast majority of the ice that we know about is in the vicinity of the poles, where obviously it should be. And and up at the poles, the temperatures are so prohibitively miserable that it would be very difficult to set up a colony there. However, recent discoveries have started to uncover very strong evidence for substantial amounts of water ice in the equatorial regions as well. And this particular discovery happened right where Elon Musk is planning to set up his first Martian colony. Years ago, SpaceX sent a request to NASA asking where NASA thought reservoirs of glacial ice might be on Mars that wasn't in the polar regions and areas of the planet that would have much more moderate temperatures. And this region was one of those locations that NASA thought might have some glacial ice. Now it's turned out, according to the Mars Express Orbiter, again from the European Space Agency, man, this orbiter has accomplished so much during its long lifespan. Well, it turns out that the reservoir of ice that's in this location is utterly colossal. Enough ice to cover the entire planet to a depth of several feet. Ever since Elon Musk put forward the idea of putting a million humans on Mars, there has been a raging debate as to whether or not the Red Planet is actually a suitable second home for human beings. There are, admittedly, quite a number of problems with this planet. Obviously, you can't breathe the air. Also, it only has one-third the gravity that Earth does. And we've seen what microgravity does to the human body over a sustained period of time. Although we don't have any solid evidence as to what reduced gravity will do to the human body by way of comparison, it could be significant or it could be a very minor impact. That we really don't know. But what we do know is that Mars is also an incredibly cold place and it is continuously bombarded by solar radiation and cosmic rays. These are significant problems as well and would, on the surface of appear to seem to be more than enough evidence that Mars is not a great place to put human beings. However, that's a gross oversimplification. And one thing that solves all of these problems completely is the presence of abundant water. How is that the case? Well, for one thing, if you're talking about a breathable atmosphere, 
you can make water into breathable air. Well, the oxygen part anyway. The nitrogen is certainly important also, but there are ways to bring nitrogen with you if you can build a sizable greenhouse. And of course, what's the most important thing that you need in order to keep your plants alive? That's right, water. As a matter of fact, you could take it a step further and use aquaponics for your greenhouse, which requires no soil, requires fish, however, and their capability of fertilizing plants. And let me tell you, the produce that comes out of aquaponic systems are absolutely incredible. And not only that, you get fish out of the deal as well. Incidentally, Long John Silvers have announced, well, this was done a few years ago, actually, that they want to be the first seafood restaurant on Mars. Okay, enough talking about that. What else can water do for you besides providing drinking water for yourself and the plants you bring along and providing breathable oxygen? Well, on top of that, water is the best defense against radiation and cosmic rays. It is used almost exclusively to protect nuclear power plant workers from the radiation generated by a nuclear core. Just a few centimeters of water ice can shield out almost all of the radiation and cosmic rays that bombard the surface of the planet. And as a matter of fact, an entire habitat built out of ice, called the Martian Ice House, was conceived because of its incredibly useful radiation shielding properties. The Martian Ice House is one of my favorite habitats that's ever been thought of on the surface of Mars. With this house, you don't need to live under the surface. A mere five cent centimeters of ice provides all the protection you need against cosmic rays and solar radiation. Here's how you build the thing, by the way. You start out with a transparent ETFE membrane. It's actually a series of nested membranes designed to provide a multi-walled enclosure for the astronauts, and this is then encased in 3D printed ice. Now, there are a number of advantages to this plan. First of all, you don't have to live beneath the surface, and you get natural light filtering into the habitat, but on top of that, you also have a front yard, so to speak, outside of the main enclosure, but still protected by the ice. In other words, you could have grass, you could have a tree planted out there if you wanted to. And this combination of natural light and the ability to take a small chunk of earth with you, plus a built-in greenhouse, as you can see right there, combined with the capability of shielding you from the radiation, well, as you can see, ice does a hell of a lot for us on the surface of Mars besides just providing drinking water. But for a considerable period of time, it was generally thought that there would be very little water ice to exploit near the equatorial regions on Mars where the temperatures were more moderate. Almost all of the ice would be found at the poles simply because any equatorial ice would have evaporated off the surface a long time ago and boiled away into space along with Mars's atmosphere. However, in recent years, we have discovered that that is not the case at all. For example, in the Noctis Labyrinthus, which you're looking at right now, we have discovered evidence of a substantial cache of ice buried just beneath the surface, several square kilometers of the stuff. And the Noctis Labyrinthus would also be an ideal place to set up a colony because the high canyon walls provide even more protection against radiation. The Curiosity rover discovered when it took readings right up against against the side of a cliff that radiation levels drop off precipitously, probably because the canyon walls provide a great deal of shade against the sun. So this would be a great place to set up a colony if not for one problem. Landslides are a serious danger in the Noctis Labyrinthus, the Vallis Marineris, any place that you have a really deep canyon. And by really deep, I mean a minimum of four times the depth of the Grand Canyon. And with those kinds of canyon walls, you can get unbelievable landslides that have estimated to travel as fast as 400 kilometers per hour. 
These kinds of landslides would obviously be a significant threat to any colony deep inside these canyons. As a result, other areas that are a little less extreme from a geological standpoint might be a better place to build a colony. And that's why this location is so important. The Medusae Fosse Formation. This is a huge geological formation about 20% of the size of the continental United States that's been the subject of an intense debate. It is a huge sedimentary formation that appears to be made out of various layers of dust and ash. Many geologists have concluded that it was formed by the various deposits given off by some of the volcanoes during the more geologically active period of Mars's history, possibly from Olympus Mons or possibly Pavonis Mons, but the area is surrounded by huge volcanoes. That, by the way, is another positive aspect to this region because even though it's fairly rugged, it's not so inhospitable as to be dangerous to set a ship down in, but it does have some of the most impressive and spectacular features on the surface of Mars in close proximity, especially. Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system, a volcano the size of Arizona that stands an unbelievable 21,900 meters high. I'd like you to think about that for a moment. A volcano that's twice the height of the general altitude of commercial air traffic. The plateau that it sits on is eight kilometers high by itself, or roughly the height of Mount Everest. Just the plateau that it sits on. It's difficult to conceive of a mountain this huge. And for those of you who are thinking that perhaps if you include the depth of the Pacific Ocean, some of the volcanic mountains in the Pacific would actually be approximately the same size, well, you're very, very wrong. Mauna Loa doesn't come close to competing with Olympus Mons. As a matter of fact, Olympus Mons would devour all of the Hawaiian islands inside its circumference. It is an absolute geologic monstrosity and would be an incredible place to go visit, especially if you lived on a colony that was fairly close by. So how much water are we actually talking about here? Well, it's an enormous amount of water. We're talking deposits as much as 3.7 kilometers thick. For the longest time, geologists thought that these deposits were just sand of some kind or dust because after all, that's what the entire formation is generally comprised of. However, it was recently discovered that if these deposits were made up of dust or ash, they would have been compacted significantly under the weight of the formation. And this is not what Mars Express was detecting. Instead, it was detecting deposits that were significantly less dense than compacted sand. And the only logical explanation is water ice. But how could this much water ice possibly still exist in the equatorial regions of the planet? Well, the answer to that question, at least we think, is very strange indeed. Mars has an unusual axial tilt. Now, currently, it's very similar to that of Earth. And therefore, the seasons on Mars are very similar to those that we have, at least in terms of the variation in temperatures and sunlight, that sort of thing, all of them seem to be fairly similar to what we experience here. However, that probably was not always the case. Mars has an axial tilt that varies widely, anywhere from as little as zero degrees to as much as 60 degrees. And while Mars was at a 60 degree axial tilt, this region of the planet may actually have been the new poles, or perhaps close to the new polar regions. And during this time, the sun would not not have been in the right location to evaporate the water ice that was present on the surface. And since the volcanoes in that region were erupting at the same time, they gradually covered over the ice, shielding it from the sun until Mars' axial tilt returned to its current position. 
Now, of course, this is only a theory, but it does seem to be a very compelling theory. And also it has significant implications for the rest of the planet. It means that there could be ice deposits all over the equatorial regions of Mars, not just in this area. Now, although these water deposits are very deep beneath the surface and would probably need the equivalent of a full-scale oil drilling outfit in order to be able to extract them, it would have an endless supply of water for a Martian colony, or at least for the conceivable future. 3.7 kilometers worth of water ice over this wide of a region would be enough to cover the entire planet in a layer of water 1.5 to 2.7 meters deep, the most water ever found in this region of Mars. So what does this mean, aside from the fact that Mars has almost everything we need to set up a thriving colony that could easily support a million people? Well, in addition to that, Mars had lots of water in its ancient past. Indeed, Mars had all of the necessary building blocks for life to arise. So does that mean that we're going to have to contend with microorganisms on the Martian surface when we start setting up our colony? Well, very probably we will. Given the fact that we have detected seasonal spikes of oxygen and methane, spikes that up to this point have no non-biological explanation, and also given the fact that the only life detection experiment that we ever sent to Mars on the Viking landers, the famous label release experiment, produced a positive result at Viking 1 and Viking 2, and also given the fact that no one has ever been able to produce a false positive utilizing this experiment, it seems very likely that not only did life evolve and thrive on the ancient Martian surface, but at least some of it managed to survive into the present day. There are earthbound extremophiles that could survive on Mars today if we just put them there. In fact, it has been theorized that the Viking landers may have carried some of these microorganisms to Mars during their visit back in 1976, but regardless, we are most probably going to have to contend with this, and that may be the most significant challenge that we ever face on the Red Planet. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. It's very important to my ability to creating more content in the future. And as always, stay angry about space.